So we continue uh, to look at uh, a, a more involved example of discharging. And to do this, let us look at some ideas uh, behind the uh, discharging method. So one uh, notion that I want to look at uh, is that uh, idea of reducibility. So let phi be a class of graphs closed under taking subgraphs. Okay? So we want to look at uh, graphs which are hereditary, right? Hereditary means that if you take uh, subgraphs, the property still remain. For example, planar graphs are uh, having this property, right? Because any subgraph of a planar graph is also planar. But not all, all graphs have this property. For example, if I just say non-planar, right? If I take subgraph, it could be planar. So that does not belong to the class. So that kind of classes I cannot take. So I take a class of graphs, which are closed under taking subgraphs. So pi b such a class. Then I have some graph property that I want to establish. Let's say property P. It could be anything like what we uh, just wrote before or some other property like colorability or you know, chromatic number right? or uh, <coughs> anything else, right? Like, you know, some existence of some small neighbor, right? Uh, or, uh, you know, existence of a neighborhood where some property is true. I mean, anything like this. So let P be some graph property. And our aim is to prove that graphs in phi right in the class that we are looking at all satisfy the property p right every graph in this class has this particular property now this is what we want to we want to prove okay now if uh, we are looking at such a question then uh, we say a set of configurations, right? Configuration is basically a substructure or a property. Set of configurations uh, is said to be reducible for a property uh, P uh, if no minimum counterexample to the property can contain any of these configurations. Okay. So I say that a set of configurations is reducible for a given property, if no minimum counterexample to P can contain any of the functions. So what is the meaning of this statement? Let us look at, uh, let us look at, uh, uh, you know, a graph and uh, a given property, right? Now, if the graph does not satisfy the property, then we say this graph is a counterexample to the property. Okay? Now, if I'm looking at a class of graphs, what I can do instead is to a set of uh, okay a set of uh, configurations uh, is said to be reducible for a property P if no minimum counterexample P can contain any of the configurations. Now we say that uh, a you know a graph uh, is a counterexample if uh, you know this graph does not satisfy the property that we are looking at. Now, if we are looking at a class of graphs, okay? So a class of graphs, we say uh, you know. Uh, has a counterexample, then we can look at all possible counterexamples. Okay. So if you can find at least one graph which is a counterexample to the property, which does not satisfy the property, then we look at, you know, we can talk about all possible such graphs which does not uh, satisfy this, right? So look at all possible counterexamples. Then we can define some kind of minimality, right? We can say that the graph with the smallest number of vertices and edges, right? which does not satisfy this property. Because there are at least some graphs which violates the property, we can talk about the one with the smallest size. So this kind of graphs we call minimum counterexamples. Okay. So what we are saying is that a substructure or a configuration is reducible if minimum counterexamples cannot contain these configurations. So what it actually means is that if you have a graph 
and if this graph has this substructure uh, this reducible configuration right and if the property is not true for this graph then even after removing this particular uh, particular uh, substructure the remaining graph will also be a counter example okay that the counter example cannot be a minimum one right you can still find a smaller counter example so such uh, you know cases are called minimum counter example uh, such configurations are called uh, reducible configurations now <clears throat> suppose we can show that you can find a set of reducible configurations that cannot be avoided in the class phi okay so i say that i have a reducible configuration and i know a set of reducible configurations and this is unavoidable in the class phi which means that every graph in the class phi must have at least one of these configurations right without having one of these no graph in this class can be there so if i can show this then what does it say it says that every graph in this class phi contains one of these configurations now if any graph in this has is a counter example to the property then uh, you know this cannot be a minimum counter example right because if there is a minimum counter example we are saying that then uh, you know it cannot contain the reducible configuration so we are saying that none of the graphs in this class can be a minimum counter example but if there is a counter example there is a minimum counter example because you look at all possible counter examples find the one with the minimum size so therefore if you show that a reducible configuration is unavoidable then we have the proof that the property must be true for the class so the idea of discharging is to show a set of reducible configurations is unavoidable right in that part and that part alone we will use the discharging method so the idea is to show some structural properties like reducibility uh, reducible configuration now the reducibility of this configuration that you have to do separately so once you show a, a configuration is reducible you can try to uh, use discharging method to show that it is unavoidable in the class and that is the uh, way this method is usually used so now let us look at a more concrete example right so here was the crux of the idea discharging method helps to establish the unavoidability of reducible configurations in a class phi if there are no minimum counter examples for a property p in phi there are no counter examples for this property in phi and therefore the graphs in phi satisfy the property p now we are going to look at a very interesting result uh, this comes from the uh, you know the questions that we were looking at before like uh, four color theorem right so we, we mentioned uh, four color theorem so what was four color theorem the four color theorem says that every planar graph can be vertex colored Such that no adjacent vertices get different, uh, uh, no distinct, um, no adjacent vertices get the same color uh, using exactly using at most four colors, right? Every planar graph admits a four color. So you can color with less than or equal to four colors. But now the question is that if all planar graphs are four colors, does uh, every such graph require four? Obviously not, right? It says that at most four. now the question is that okay which graphs actually require four which graphs will do with three which graphs will do with two right etc now the case uh, you know uh, two is very easy right we know that a graph is two colorable if and only if it is bipartite so therefore even for planar graphs it is two colorable if and only if it is bipartite so bipartite planar graphs are easy to characterize so therefore that question is uh, resolved now the question is that okay when can you say the graph requires four colors or three colors right 
So can can you say that okay, this class of uh, graphs require only three colors, or this graph requires four colors? So there were several attempts to uh, resolve these kind of questions. Many of them are still unresolved. And one of the uh, interesting questions was uh, uh, an old conjecture. Okay? So this conjecture was that suppose you have planar graphs, right? Now, if if you take a planar graph and uh, you say that you don't allow any any triangles in it, okay? Mm -hmm. There is no triangle, then you know that the triangle-free planar graph uh, has at most two n minus four edges that we proved. And this will uh, easily show us that, like, you know, uh, uh, the graph can be three colored. Okay? So, planar graphs without triangles can be three colored, which is very easy to show. I want you to come up with a proof if you want uh, a nice exercise. You can think about this. And uh, uh, so, therefore, that is not uh, interesting uh, for uh, triangle free planar graphs. So, we will allow planar graphs with triangles. Now the question is that, okay, suppose we have uh, planar graph, but we don't allow four cycles or five cycles. Okay? Now it turns out that a planar graph without uh, no four cycles uh, only, right? If you just forbid four cycles, then you can find uh, examples where you need four colors. So therefore then somebody asked, okay, what if I don't allow four cycles and five cycles? So the conjecture said that, if uh, you have planar graph where there is no four cycle or five cycle, then the graph is three color. Now this conjecture was uh, you know, open for many years, only very recently, like in two years before or three years before, it was, uh, maybe I don't know, maybe four or five years before, it was disproved. Uh, but uh, it, it still gives many other interesting questions. So what we are going to show is that something related to this conjecture. Okay. So we are going to prove the following theorem that every planar graph that does not have cycles of length 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. up to 11. Okay. There is no 4 cycle, 5 cycle, 6 cycle, 7 cycle, etc. No 10 cycle, no 11 cycle. Okay. So if all the cycles are not there, then the graph is three color. So we have just made it weaker by adding more uh, you know, forbidden cycles, right? And we are going to prove it using discharging method. Now, let me mention a little bit uh, about this. So, you know, one person proved uh, this very easily, right? You know, uh, where uh, if you don't allow four to 11 cycles, then we can say it is three colorable. Then, uh, you know, after some trials, we could see that, okay, this is easily uh, improvable to 4 to 10. So somebody proved that, okay, if there are no cycles of length 4 to 10, then the graph is three colorable. Now this uh, second part, right, you know, 4 to 10 uh, can be a good homework question after uh, you do this uh, uh, lecture. Then somebody improved it further saying that, okay, if there are no cycles of length 4 to 9, then the graph is three colorable, planar graph. Again, after some time, somebody improved it. If there are no cycles of length 4 to 8, it is also three colorable. And finally, with much more difficulty, somebody proved that if there are no cycles of length 4 to 7, then the graph is three colorable. Then after this, somebody proved that the conjecture, original conjecture, that if there are no 4 to 5 cycles, then the graph is three colorable is false, right? You need four colors. They come, come up with counter example, saying that, okay, these graphs uh, have no four cycles or five cycles, which are planar, but still requires four colors. So now the only question that remains open is that if there are no four, four cycle, five cycle, or six cycle, then can you say the graph is uh, three color? I mean, I don't mean the only question, like, you know, one natural uh, question, which is still open. Okay, so this is, uh, so if you study this method and read up some more interesting uh, you know, uh, follow up papers, you may be able to look at this uh, technique again. Because all these proofs are by discharging method, by again, and then try to prove that if there are no cycles of length four, five, or six, 
then the graph is gray color. If you can do that, it's a very, very uh, nice result and uh, we'll be very uh, happy with it. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let us, uh, let us uh, try to prove this very weak uh, result, right? One of the weakest in this chain. That uh, if there are no cycles of length 4 to 11, the graph is breakable. So we start with a set of reducible configurations. So now I claim that for the three colorability of uh, graphs, a cut vertex and a vertex of degree less than or equal to is a reducible configuration. Uh, is uh, a set of reducible configurations. Okay, which means that if you are talking about three colorability of graphs, minimum counterexample to three colorability cannot contain cut vertices, right? And minimum counterexample to three colorability cannot contain vertices of degree less than or equal to. Again, these are two easy, very easy to prove, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, statements. So I want you to think about this and try to prove it yourself before going into the next phase. So stop the, you know, and then wait for some time. Try to work out uh, this yourself. Show why uh, uh, cut vertex and vertex of degree less than or equal to cannot be part of minimum contract sample to three color ability. Okay, let us look at why. So let us take a cut vertex. Okay. So suppose G uh, is a minimum contract sample to three color ability and the graph G has a cut vertex in it. Okay, let X be a cut vertex in this graph. So we have this cut vertex. So what is by definition of cut vertex, right? If I remove it, I will get several components. So let us say that C1 to CK are our components, right? After removing X. C1, C2, C3, etc. up to CK. So these are the components. C1 to CK are the components of this uh, graph. Right after removing X. Now what I do is that I look at the component C1 together with the vertex X. So X has neighbors to C1. So I look at all these neighbors. including, uh, you know, including the component C1, I look at this subgraph. Now, of course, uh, this subgraph is uh, a smaller graph than G, right? So if G was a minimum contract sample, then uh, to three color ability, then this graph, so the component C1 plus X, that subgraph is definitely three color, right? Similarly, C2 with X is also three color because it is smaller than G. Similarly, CK with X is also three colorable. So therefore, CI union X is all uh, three colorable, strict subgraphs of G, which are all three colorable. Now this tells that the, the graph G itself is three colorable. And why is that? Can you think about this? Okay. So if, uh, if each component with X is three colorable, then I claim that the graph itself together with X is also three color. Now this is easy to see because if I look at uh, any coloring of C1 with X, X will get some color, let's say red in that, right? Now C2 with X also have a coloring, but X may be given uh, getting a color, let's say blue there. But now it doesn't matter. What I do is that I take the component C2, then I will change the name of the colors. All uh, blue vertices I will call green, and all the green vertices I will call blue. I just rename the colors blue and green, right? Exchange the colors. So, the, so that the uh, coloring of C2 with X is still proper, but X will get the color green again. Similarly, I can do it for each of the component. So I will make sure that X gets the same color in all the coloring of the subgraphs. So therefore, all together, again, it will be a proper coloring because each component gives a proper coloring with the X getting green, I will get a proper coloring of the entire graph. <clears throat> now, vertex of degree less than or equal to 2 
you cannot be a part of a minimum contact sample because if I look at G minus X as a subgraph, G minus X can be three colored means that I can extend the coloring to include X also because if you look at the vertex X, it has at most two neighbors. And uh, since I am using three colors, even if you know X is seeing two different colors in the neighborhood, the third color is never going to be used in the neighborhood of X. So therefore, I can give X with that uh, that color. So therefore, that also is easy. So therefore, vertices of degree less than or equal to two, or vertices of uh, uh, which are cut vertices, cannot be part of minimum contact sample. So therefore, they are reducible configurations for three colorability. Now, we want to prove uh, the theorem. For that, it is sufficient uh, if you show that every planar graph without cycles of length 4 to 11 contains either a cut vertex or a vertex of degree at most 2, right? Because as we just observed, the class of graphs without cycles of length 4 to 11 all the subgraphs also has this property, okay? If there are no cycles of length 4 to 11 in a graph, if I, if I delete something, you cannot create a cycle of length 4 to 11, okay? Uh, therefore, uh, you will see that any subgraph will have this property. Now, what we are saying is that every such graph contains either a cut vertex or a vertex of degree less than equal to two, Therefore, none of the minimum contract sample to the three colorability can be any of these graphs. But if there is a counter example in this class, I can always talk about the smallest counter example, right? And therefore, it cannot be there. So that is the idea. So to prove that any such graph contains either a cut vertex or vertex of degree less than equal to two, we are going to use the discharging method. So again, we start with the charging phase. So what is our charging phase? We are going to assign a charge D of V minus 6 to each vertex of the graph. So the degree minus 6. This is the one uh, that we did in the first example, right? the trivial example. So the charge of V, phi of V is DV minus 6. Then we assign a charge twice the length of the phase minus six to each phase of the graph. Again, the charge of phase is two F minus six. So the total charge is summation over all the vertices, degree minus six, plus summation over all the phases, two F minus six, which is actually equal to minus 12 by Euler identity. Now, why I say equal is that because we, did, we assume that there are no cut vertices, one can show that this is actually an equality. Right, uh, every phase is actually incident to exactly two phases, and that will tell you that the Euler identity appears as an equality. I mean, in the summation, you will get a not a not Euler identity. The, the degree sum will uh, uh, appear as an equality. So therefore, you will get the total charge in the graph to be minus two, and this is true for any planar graph in this class that we are looking at. Right. So any such planar graph will have total charge be minus 12. Right? How large the graph doesn't matter. Whatever the size of the graph, the total will be always minus 12. Now, <clears throat> we come up with the discharging rule, right? So the discharging rule says that every phase with length at least 12 sends a charge of plus 3 by 2 to each of its vertices. Now, this might look like a kind of odd idea, right? I mean, how do you come up with the discharging rule? See, to learn the discharging method, the important fact is to see how you come up with the discharging rule. Now, this, this is not always an easy phase, but uh, here, is, here is the idea uh, what we want to do here, right? So the idea uh, of the discharging method as 
we mentioned before is to show that we first start with a charging and take the total charge right the total charge i will show that is going to be a fixed number right or uh, either negative or positive right so here we showed that the total charge is negative 12 which is negative number then the idea is that you know you move around the charges right to show that there is you know some some structural properties like the uh, reducible configurations are present what we are going to show is to uh, move around the charges and say that okay after moving around the charges if the particular property that we want is not there then the total is going to be different now if i can show that the total is going to be different then that says that there is something wrong with the assumption that we assume that there is no uh, reducible configuration present that was the problem and therefore uh, we can show that it must be present right so it's unavoidable now what we want to show in this case is that since the total charge is negative i want to somehow show that the total charge is going to be non negative if there is no cut vertex or vertices of degree less than equal to so the idea of the charging is to make sure that the uh, the total charge will be non negative if we assume uh, wrongly right uh, we assume that uh, there are no cut vertices or vertices of degree and uh, less than equal to so for that purpose we have to design the discharging rule so how to move around the charges depends on that so the the ones with uh, the least negative charges should get a lot of uh, positive charge so that it will become non negative and the one with uh, no uh, you know which is already positive charge does not need to get anything maybe right and uh, others uh, depending on the cases you can decide how much charge it should get so this is how you design the rules so in this case we look at this uh, questions and then come up with this following rule at every phase with length at least 12 sends a charge of plus 3 by 2 to each of its vertices now let us see what happens right so first observation is that if there is a vertex v which is uh, uh, not a cut vertex then uh, we we observe that uh, it is incident to at least uh, degree many distinct phases right all the phases are distinct phases so if a vertex is not a uh, cut vertex then we say that each of the phases are distinct phases now our claim is that uh, for the class of graphs that we are looking at every vertex uh, is incident with at least a uh, ceiling of degree by 2 distinct phases of length larger than 12 i mean greater than equal to 12 okay so large phases okay. so i call a phase large if the length is at least 12 so we are saying that for every vertex it has at least ceiling of degree by 2 many distinct large phases incident with now why is this true this is true because of this property that if you look at uh, if you look at any uh, vertex which is not a cut vertex it has exactly degree v many uh, phases and now right uh, it has exactly degree v many phases but now two adjacent phases of the graph cannot be triangles so i claim that two adjacent phases cannot be triangles right this is not possible why is that not possible can you think of why two adjacent vertices can be three sides so think for a few uh, minutes before we proceed so if you have uh, thought about this you must have observed that uh, if i have two uh, adjacent uh, three cycles triangle then they together form a four cycle right this three cycle plus uh, this three cycle right this forms a four cycle in the graph but we look at graphs which does not contain any cycles of length 4 5 6 or up to 11 right 
So since there are no four cycles in the graph, right? Uh, you cannot have two triangles sharing an edge. But now, since I have degree many distinct uh, phases, only alternate phases can be at most small phases, right? So if I have a small phase, uh, if I have a small phase, then uh, the you know the the next immediate phases can be uh, only large, and uh, then uh, you know the alternate ones can be again small, but then again. Uh, you know, this must be large, but this also must be large, right? So therefore, at least, so at most a degree uh, by two a ceiling, I mean, floor many can be uh, small uh, triangles. Therefore, uh, the remaining, which is, uh, you know, ceiling of dv by two must be uh, of length greater than equal to 12. And why is that? Because uh, we don't allow uh, cycles of length 4 to 11 in the graph anyway. So if there is no three cycle, then the next is going to be large cycle, right? Okay, so that is our observation that uh, if, uh, if uh, you are looking at graphs in the class pi, then every vertex is incident with at least ceiling of degree v by, by 2 distinct phases of uh, length at least 12. So this uh, this tells you that these phases are going to give you, uh, you know, you know, this, this these many phases are going to give you, uh, you know, uh, positive charges, right? Plus 3 by 2. Now, again, by our assumption, the graph has no vertex of degree less than or equal to 2. So the second uh, uh, assumption was that, uh, you know, we are, we are looking at graphs and showing that there is no uh, cut vertex or degree less than or equal to 2, right? So, so by assumption, you know, our graph does not have vertex of degree less than or equal to 2, because if it is there, we are already done. Now, therefore, what happens after the discharging, right? So after the discharging, each vertex gets a charge plus 3 by 2 from each of its degree by two ceiling many phases, right, of, of length greater than equal to 12, right, that many phases are incident. So we see that uh, after discharging, every uh, vertex gets uh, this many charges, right. So let us see what, what this implies. This says that for every phase, right, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the length of the phase uh, can be either 3 or like you know, 12, uh, 13, etc., right? If the length of the phase is 3, then its charge is not affected, right? Because the small phases does not give away charges. It does not get any charge. So, therefore, its initial charge remains. So, what is the initial charge of a 3 cycle? It's 2 into 3 minus 6, which is 0. So, all the triangles still have charge 0. <clears throat> which is non negative. Now, if you look at a phase of length uh, greater than or equal to uh, 12, uh, uh, it is 12, not 2, right? So, greater than or equal to 12, uh, this vertex, uh, this phase gives away this uh, uh, phase gives away plus 3 by 2 to each of the uh, each of its vertices right so what happens to uh, each of these vertices it gets plus 3 by 2 but what happens to the phase its charge decreases by 3 by 2 into the number of vertices right so it is two times uh, the length of the phase minus 6 is the initial charge minus uh, 3 by 2 into cardinal t of f, which is the charge it gave away. Now, what is this? Which is f by 2 minus 6, right? Length of f by 2 minus 6. But length of f by 2 minus 6 is greater than or equal to 0 if f is greater than or equal to 12, right? Large phases uh, has the uh, you know, enough 
surplus charges to give away and still be having non negative charges. So we designed our number 3 by 2 so that this works out also, right? Now for any vertex V, right? So we saw that every phase after the discharging has non negative charge, right? Now what happened to the vertices? So if you look at any vertex, its initial charge was degree minus 6. What happened to it? It got from all the large phases incident to it, it got charge plus 3 by 2. So what happened to the vertices in the graph? Uh, it has degree either 3, 4, 5, 6 larger numbers, right? So if the vertex degree was 3, its initial charge was minus 3. Okay? So initial charge was minus 3. But then uh, what happened to it? It has at least degree by 2 ceiling, which is ceiling of 3 by 2, which is 2. Two vertices. We, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it has at least two uh, large phases incident to it, and these two large phases must have given it plus three by two charges. So two into three by two, which is plus three. So the vertex degree three gets a charge of three from its uh, phases, at least three, right? So therefore, three plus minus three, which is zero. So its charge becomes zero, right? So we designed our number plus three by two so that this also happens. Then again, uh, what happened to the vertex of degree 4? Its charge becomes, uh, it was potentially minus 2, but it gets at least uh, 3 again, so therefore it becomes plus 1. Similarly, degree 5, it, it gets actually uh, 3 times uh, plus 3 by 2, so it is going to become positive again. And uh, degree greater than or equal to 6 is going to be uh, you know, always greater than or equal to 0, because it is not going to lose any charge, it's only going to get positive charges. So therefore, every vertex of the graph after the discharging has positive charge, right? non-negative charge. Every phase after the discharging has non-negative charge. And this says that the total charge is going to be the sum of all the vertex charges plus sum of all the phase charges, which is going to be non-negative. But this is impossible, right? So after the discharging, we say we see that all the vertices and the faces has non-negative charge, which is impossible. Now, why this impossibility came? Because we assumed that there were no vertices of degree less than or equal to 2, right? If there is a vertex of degree 2, by doing this uh, discharging, its charge, which was initially minus 4, need not become positive, right? Similarly, if there was a vertex, uh, which is a cut vertex, this could also uh, not uh, become uh, uh, negative because uh, you know it it might have several uh, phases that we overcounted because two of the phases that we are thinking are different might be the same. So it may not have enough phases to give its positive charge. So the total charge after discharging uh, will be negative, uh, and that happen to be non-negative only because we assumed wrongly that there is no cut vertex or uh, vertices of degree uh, less than or equal to 2. Right? So that is the idea and this, this proves that uh, this proves that uh, uh, there must be a cut vertex right? which uh, gives uh, this kind of situations right? where we you know we don't have a degree by too many large faces or uh, degree two vertices, which also be, will not become uh, non-negative. So at least one of these must be present in the class because the total can never be non-negative, right? Because it was minus 12. So this establishes the result, right? Now, uh, here is a nice former question, right? So let G be a planar graph where there are no cycles of length uh, 4 to 10, right? So we started looking at the question 4 to 11. Now we say that, okay, we allow 11 cycles, but uh, there are no cycles of length 4 to 10. Now, can you show that the graph is three colorable? I claim that this can be, uh, this can be done by slightly modifying the proof that we did. So take it as a challenge and try to do it. It may be a little uh, hard work, but 
it will be nice. Now, uh, again, I think I mentioned this already that the conjecture that the planar graph with no four size cycles of uh, 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 length four or five is three colorable is a false conjecture because the conjecture was disproved uh, uh, a couple of years back. But a still open question is that uh, if there are no four, five, six or cycles in the planar graph, can we say the graph is three color? So an overview of what we did was that uh, we know the discharging method works as follows. We want to uh, show some uh, uh, property is true for a class of uh, graphs, right? So we have a class of graph Y. We want to show some property P. We try to come up with a set of uh, substructures, right? Like, you know, like the examples we saw, cut vertices, degrees of uh, small degree vertices, or some other things like that. Uh, certain configurations are reducible for this property. So try to come up with such proper, uh, sub, such substructures. For this property, it is reducible, right? No minimum counterexample to this particular property can contain this. Now try to show that is, uh, is it possible to show that one of the structures must be present in the class of graphs that we are looking at or for what class of graphs we can show something like this. And if you can show that it is unavoidable for that particular class, we know that the property must be true. And uh, to show this, we do the discharging and the discharging is by, by uh, giving some initial charges. This initial charging will depend on what we do with the discharging phase. Now the discharging phase depends on what we want to actually show, right? So depending on the type of property that we want to show, we have to design uh, the rules of moving around the surface. And once this, uh, you know, uh, trial is there, you can try out whether it works or if you can slightly modify it, then you can, you know, again, uh, try to, uh, uh, change, uh, you know, uh, something like this, or you can change the reducible configuration set itself, maybe slightly, and uh, try again with uh, different discharging groups. So, and at some point it works out, then you have the result. Right? So that is the that is the basic idea of discharging method. So try this homework. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, uh, we can stop this uh, short introduction to discharging method. So I can I can give you more interesting questions on this, and maybe uh, look at uh, some related uh, topics later.